Welcome, everyone. My name is Paul Wells. I'm a senior writer at McLean's Magazine. Uh, and we've been doing this now for three weeks in a row. It's starting to feel like uh, appointment viewing. Uh, and I'm uh, grateful to everyone who's joined us. Um, all of these uh, weekly sessions of McLean's Live, just like all of our monthly sessions uh, back in the day when people were going out uh, and doing things, are sponsored by our friends at the Canadian Bankers Association. We're very grateful for them to uh, uh, be helping us to bring these events to you. I'm here in my uh, living room, and uh, over there in his living room is Dr. James Muscolic, uh, emergency room physician, um, author. We're going to talk about both of those vocations, uh, art collector, and, uh, <laughs> and we're really grateful uh, to have you join us, uh, Dr. James, as you're called sometimes yeah. by your colleagues in, uh, in Ethiopia. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. I, I just want to get off. How did you know how to pronounce my name? Because I have been uh, uh, motoring through both the uh, ebook and the audio book <laughs> of uh, your second book, Life on the Ground Floor, Maybe Letters from the Edge of Emer Emergency Medicine. Mm -hmm. um, okay, cool. For which, uh, you lousy son of a gun, you won the Hillary Western Writers Trust Prize in 2017. I did. Yeah, I did. That's a prize for which I was not even nominated, but I'll get it. <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, so, and you, read, you read the book yourself, so I take your pronunciation to be authoritative. Um, <laughs> now you are, we'll get, we'll get around to a bunch of the other stuff that you do, but you're an emergency room doctor at St. Yeah. Mike's in Toronto. Uh, and I guess the most obvious question is the one that a lot of people want to hear. What, what's that been like over the last couple of months? You know, it's, it's been intense, you know, I, and... I used to use that as a play on words when people ask me about my MSF work. What's MSF work like? I'm like intense, you know, in all senses of that word, right? <laughs> but um, this is just, uh, it was a, the front line came to us. You know, as soon as I thought, knew there was one, I went towards it. And, and, you know, although there were harbingers of this happening and people speculated it on a slide, a global pandemic, even those of us in global health didn't expect it to arrive like this or so sudden. So I, I think about it in, in like, we're the first, what's called the innate immune response in the ER. And just like the, your immune system has a memory of having faced challenges in the past, but may just rise up to keep a, a pathogen at bay until you're able to get specific. Meaning that, you know, once you're infected with measles, you, you don't need to get it again. But when you're first exposed to it, you develop a kind of response that is fever and this and that. So we're, the ER is kind of like that. So as soon as we saw this virus move from China and then start to land in New York and cases go up, you know, on came our PPE. We had a bit of a that learned immunity from SARS. On came the PPE. You say goodbye to your friends, their faces, and their warm embrace sometimes. You lose the contact with patients. You maybe don't even touch them physically. You sometimes it's more difficult to touch them emotionally or let them know that they're being cared for. And it, it becomes, uh, ER was already a difficult place and then it became more impersonal than ever before. So it's, it's been a challenge for us. And just as it has affected the weaknesses in people's bodies, some people's bodies, it's also shown us weaknesses in our city and our society as well too. And I know we're gonna to come to that. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, let's back up a little bit to January or last autumn, you know, mm -hmm. recent history, but before uh, most of us had even heard of this virus, before it was uh, uh, present uh, and, and diagnosed in Canadian patients. Um, how ready were you and St. Mike's and Ontario for uh, a pandemic influenza outbreak? Had there, were there protocols? Were they known? Uh, had they been uh, practiced? Uh, how, how prepared in concrete uh, um, terms were you for something like this happening? You know, it was like an advanced, almost like, like again, I'll just use the immune system analogy. It's like the nodal warning, you know, first Wuhan. Once it left Wuhan and then arrived to Italy, then we're like, that is a close, that's a close environment to, to ours. 
you know, you can imagine the health system being similar. So we knew that something was on the way. And having had this kind of learned experience through SARS, we were prepared to, you know, to turn our ER, to protect ourselves in the ER. And then what became kind of new for us is not just protecting our Toronto ER or the possible ERs who are exposed. Now we're talking about protecting the whole country. And we're talking about trying to, <laughs> a long, playing a long game, the long game. So what that meant is like trying to protect patients who didn't have it, <laughs> trying to keep our staff safe based on what we saw in Wuhan and Italy and New York, because that is a very worrying phase when your fellow workers get sick because the motivation to continue to show up <laughs> is uh, dwindles, right? So what, you know, to the testament, I think, of Canada in general, and I know people are going to talk about, oh, Sweden and Korea and, and uh, New Zealand as, as leaders. I think we, we did as close to nailing it as anybody. We have this coordinated public health response. We were able to share information between hospitals and hospitals in Italy and New York and learn the particularities about a disease we hadn't even been exposed to yet. So, you know, we flared into this mode in really, uh, uh, I can't say effortless, but a determined way. So, um, you know, I, I, hindsight is twenty twenty, but I, I do feel that everyone proceeded with integrity every step along the way, every step along the way, from top to bottom, including the public. And, and I'm on a, I'm on a call after this um, with the National Kind of Emergency Positions Association, and it's entitled, uh, Where to the Front Line from Here? And I just noticed how quickly everyone, everyone seemed like they were front line. The people wearing masks, the people isolating at home. It was just such a heartening time for us, even though, you know, we were worried. We were worried. Um, you've already mentioned SARS a couple of times. That 2003 uh, outbreak of uh, novel coronavirus, a very similar virus, uh, was essentially boot camp for just about everyone who would later be involved in responding to this one. Uh, how good a uh, uh, boot camp was it? To, to what extent was it, a, did it, did it, did it teach everyone exactly what this was going to be like? To what extent has this new virus thrown curveballs? Yeah, I wonder about that. You know, I think this was like, the, the curveballs of this virus in many ways are the state of mind that goes along with it. And what I mean by that is, you know, SARS-1 was so pre-social media. It was pre like YouTube and the, you know, the, the easy and effortless sharing of, I'm not going to say misinformation, but let's say fear. Let's just say fear. And I'm not, I'm not going to criticize people for being afraid. I'm not going to criticize people for wanting to know the best they can. I truly think that's how we all discover answers that work for us. But what, you know, what, is different about this is you can have a wildly, you know, speculative news article designed to get clicks and shares become, you know, a zeitgeist. And, you know, that's a difference in that we saw in SARS-1. And now SARS-1, I was working for the CMAJ, the Canadian Medical Association Journal, as an editor, an editorial fellow. And I was so um, mesmerized and, and heartened by how effortless information was share shared among China, Hong Kong, Vietnam, Canada, you know, just the genome, all of these. Uh, so it was, it was a great example of, of cooperation. So I th you see that you can find in this epidemic, not just as a, it's a different, there's a different nature, way more cases, way more cases. So very different, it's been very fast all over the world. So very different than SARS-1, but also to the information cycle it's just so endless, you know, it's so, it's so uh, anxiety provoking for people because, you know, you're looking at the cases, you're looking at the curves, people are doing like different graphs to show our values going up and down. So at the same time we're educating our populace, we're also um, kind of get, allowing this um, a rise of um, the anxiety that goes with not being sure to, to live with us along with this virus. Um. I've heard it said that this virus throws a bit of a curveball. It's uh, the case fatality rate is not huge, right? Uh, it's mm -hmm. it's worse than 
uh, seasonal flu, but it's 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 the furthest thing from a from a guaranteed um, trip to the morgue. Uh, but it's also highly contagious, and as we've learned going along, it's contagious for for some time before symptoms present. Yeah. Um, did 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 that? I mean, how did that enter into the management of the epidemic? You know, I I miss. All I have is my clinical experience to draw from in terms of not just this virus, but viruses in general. You know, there was a measles epidemic when I was in Sudan and just, you know, how many cases of the common cold you actually see or in babies or adults that come into the ER. So the concept of asymptomatic throughout the whole illness, I'm still skeptical. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly, um, it's possible I've got to come up and on that, but the way that the, there is an asymptomatic phase, so the asymptomatic phase can look like, you know, you've been in contact with the virus, it started to replicate inside your cells, and before your immune system mounts a response, the viruses are having their own version of a life inside of you, and they've entered into your secretions, and so you're passing them along. So really, that is what the, the, the strength is in the distancing, in a way. It is not just like knowing the illness and being clear about the symptoms. It's also knowing that there's going to be maybe a few days. And if I'm wrong about it, you know, maybe a whole illness where you don't show very classic symptoms. But you know, how, that's how people are really protecting us um, in the ER. And I really, really mean that. You know, I think that this, uh, st- uh, I, uh, what's it called? Like I'm not isolating in place or whatever the, the term is. Um, has given us a chance to do what we need to do to make this safe for everybody, which is like practice, 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 practice. So we practice PPE, we practice through experience now, we've kept people safe, we've seen cases, we're knowing the disease, we're knowing the virus, and now, you know, we are not just ER doctors and nurses and, you know, the many people who make an ER work, now we're people too. We want a, we want a life, and so we are... Um, I just think everyone knows so much more now. And I mean, the average person knows more about this disease, diseases in general, epidemiology. It's amazing how quickly we can integrate this information and how, how people have really responded. You know, it's, it's remarkable. What was it like on the ground floor uh, at, uh, at uh, St. Mike's? Um, were there days when you thought we're not going to be able to stay on top of this, this thing is going to get out of control or were did you have that margin of comfort throughout? I guess it, it, it was looked different for different people on different days, right? <laughs> including me. So, you know, there were, I, I was pretty confident that should I contact the virus that, uh, you know, I, I would have a good outcome. I don't know. I'm just going on numbers, right? I have no, I have no uh, crystal ball, obviously, but I just based on the numbers. Um, but we were really worried about, leaving each other in the lurch really you know if a bunch of us got sick then who's gonna who's gonna who's gonna see the sick patients especially if we get a surge so i think everyone's jobs just got changed abruptly with the 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 ways i described earlier about you know now being unavailable in a certain way to each other and your patients constantly kind of drifting in an anonymous way through the hospital and then you know everything got interrupted in terms of the the functioning of the hospital you know, the operating room shut down. We couldn't just get a normal ultrasound for people. It was, uh, it was a challenge. So in the midst of this, you know, the epidemic that followed us into this is still here. The ang- epidemic of anxiety and depression and loneliness, that's still here. So, you know, we saw a lot of p- cases come in of people who felt short of breath, but they actually were, were just very, you know, uh, nervous. Um, mm-hmm. So to answer your question, yeah, you know, I still don't, know if we're on top of it (laughs) i do know that you can count on us i do know that we are prepared as any people can be to to stand together with with people in toronto and canada and and meet this however it takes and that's really what you know that's what being a canadian is (laughs) not to get too patriotic about it but um i think we have what it takes our health system does or you know our solidarity between our public health and our 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 and our hospitals, et cetera. So I'm not sure if we, I don't, there wasn't a moment where we felt we lost it, okay. but we're still, I don't think we feel like we're out of the woods yet either. 
this crisis has this crisis because I don't want to, I want to talk about it in future perfect, not in past tense, because it, it's yeah. still going on. Mm -hmm. Has it pointed up weaknesses in the system that we need to pay close attention to? I asked because there was a couple nervous days when we, when, when we knew it was going to be serious, but it, most of it hadn't happened yet, where a bunch of journalists were saying, okay, well, what is capacity in the uh, intensive care units in Ontario hospitals? And you, you pull it up, it's all public. And oh my goodness, most Ontario hospitals, the intensive care units are already over capacity, have been chronically for, for years. Uh, and they, th there's not a lot of empty ventilator beds sitting around waiting for someone to show up. Um, is that something that should be addressed or is that just the way hospitals are, are going to be run? Yeah, you know, I guess weaknesses is a, is a way to think about it. And I think that that reflection is best taken in, in comparing like the new strengths that we've discovered. Okay. So, I think that the way that we care for our elderly is pretty weak, to be honest with you. I think that's weak. I think that uh, the way to care for our homeless population is weak, <laughs> very weak. And I think that there's growth opportunities for us in both areas. And there is also growth opportunities for us in the hospital. I'll tell you some things that worked very well. Uh, that, Cause that's, that's what is easiest for me to discern the weaknesses I guess we haven't exploited those because we haven't say had that surge that we're all been wait, waiting for. But the, the strengths that I've noticed are an increased sense of solidarity. Like there's no division. Typically, if you let's just use an example, like let's say you're the, you're, you're a, a surgeon on call and you know, you have a, you have a life and you have a operating time and you have patient practice and you have a clinic and it's, it's hard to manage them all. And so, you, get, you know, you now you have to answer calls from the ER and try to find space for patients and do this very complicated work. But, and keep in mind your, the, 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 your patient load and your clinic and your operating time and all that stuff. When this pandemic started, you know, everyone around the table was just so together. They were like, how do we, can we make the fracture clinic, a very, very busy fracture clinic, can we make that overflow space for sick people? The family medicine team was like, can, how do we, how can we help? Just let us know. We'll do anything. You know, we can set up, and they did actually do this. They set up a place across the street where, you know, minor, not minor, but like less acute cases could go. And it just was such a great example of, of efficiency, f flexibility and efficiency. And I hope that, that, that attention to the burden of disease continues. And um, so there's that. There is, you know, the, the ER where we were, was given this great priority. So I'm, I feel blessed, you know, in the eyes of the hospital, we, people, people didn't need to come to the ER. They didn't go, they went straight to the floor or the, you know, the CT scanner, et cetera. And that gave us some, some more um, downtime. So I think that there are some great learning opportunities here, including one that I hope is on the way, which is, I was talking to my director today and she calls it smoothing, meaning recognizing the hospital functions should function to some extent like the human body 24 hours a day, seven days a week that we tried to, you know, try to get most people a job between nine to five, Monday to Friday is maybe not the right model. So I think we're shifting things around quite a lot. And, and as we're looking to either life after COVID or, you know, life with it, which is, I think going to be the next little while. Um, we're thinking like, what are the best things of it that we can draw into a life beyond it, a life with it and a life beyond it. So uh, that's really, and everyone's having this conversation, right? Across the planet. It's just really, really, really special, you know? Now there are people who say, what the heck? We just, we shut down the entire global economy uh, for a disease that, most people haven't got, most of them who have are in old folks homes. Uh, even, a, even a lot of them, it's not fatal. And for the rest of us who could be out here learning, earning a living, um, you know, they're, they're making us stay at home and wear masks and keep our kids at home. And, you know, isn't it all much ado about nothing? Mm -hmm. How would you answer that? Well, I think the way to answer that was with like education 
and um, and it's, you know exploring education and you know motivation I suppose you know when I I speak to it I mention to people like the really like the mask wearing is a lot about not giving that disease rather than it is not catching it and just phrase it in that way that gives people a sense of like autonomy I think mandating something is very difficult for people to accept um, especially when they're concerned about their family and their livelihood so I totally get it and you know part of me wants to say <laughs> you're by doing what has happened you know you've, you've saved my friends lives and I don't know how to how to thank you enough for that really it, you know that to see that how many people across the world healthcare workers have gone sick and some who have died I just am so grateful for people to endure this difficulty but it's given us this opportunity to make sure that we're stalwart and steadfast to those people who are clamoring to open up I don't blame them they're they're afraid and um I I do question sometimes the the uh, idea of, you know, it's we need to worry about our economy because there, there is nothing, <laughs> there's no such thing except healthy people and a healthy planet. So how, what do you mean by economy? I guess that would be by, what, what are you talking about? Do you mean to pay your rent? Okay, you know, that's that's maybe a different question. Do you mean this, like, the, the, the things opening up, the stores opening up? Okay, that's maybe a different question. But I think that you answer these questions by giving people as much information as possible, recognizing that they have, you know, they have a good heart and they are worried about their family and their livelihoods and their friends. So, you know, what, what it looks like now is, okay, we've got this to this point. Can we all agree on that? Yeah, great. So now without abandon, with the calm collective, cool assessment of science let's move gently into a space that can hold us all that's it that's it and then as if we're able to do that and we're able to do it together then we will feel more reassured we'll feel more together and more involved and i think that that will lead to you know a a, a greater idea of what a healthy economy is what a healthy you know ecology is how to be better at taking care of yourself and other people um, so I don't blame them. You know, I'm not, I'm not angry. I just want to, I want to reassure them that, you know, we are with them and we, we're, we're vulnerable and we're not going to stop working if we get a surge, but it makes it more likely we're going to get infected by a large dose of virus. And so we'd like to avoid that <laughs> if we can. Yeah. Are you confident that the worst is behind you? Oh God, no. <laughs> I mean, I mean, as a person, no. I mean, as a, for us as a population, I mean, the best is ahead, for sure. Is the worst behind us? I can't say. The best is ahead. I mean, out of this pandemic, but also as a society of people, you know, that my nine-year-old nephew, Sam, can, maybe he's 10, he's 10, um, can uh, understand the world as an ecosystem that my zoology professors didn't get, you know. I, I think that, there is a more beautiful like, enunciation of what we're doing. And it's this type of calam. I don't know if I wouldn't call it a calamity. Let's call it a, an opportunity, a crisis and an opportunity. Brings certain things to bear and we can understand ourselves better through, through it. And the pace of innovation, you know, has happened mostly out of conflict, right? But now our conflict is with an invisible enemy. And so we, what, how, how can we answer it? Um, and also just knowing that there's no answer to COVID in Toronto, for instance, without solving it in the homeless population and the long-term care facilities. There's no answer to COVID in Canada without making sure America is safe and has its, you know, is able to control their epidemic too. And that's just, that's just real and always been true. Really. Um, let's talk about the experiences in your life that give you a broader, longer perspective on all of this. Uh, your second book is substantially about, um, well, it's about working at St. Mike's, but it's also about, about working in Ethiopia um, for Médecins Sans Frontières. And your first book is about an earlier trip to Sudan, also for uh, Doctors Without Borders. Uh, why'd you do that? And, and let's, take a, let's take a fair chunk of time to talk about what that was like. 
Yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll talk with about the MSF experience and then I'll talk about the book if we want to get there at some point. Um, but the MSF experience, great branding. <laughs> they had me at the Doctor Without Borders. And, you know, I, I more or less went medical school, had an opportunity to, to travel and work in a public system in Santiago, Chile, more or less to impress this woman who um, um, I wanted to impress. <laughs> and uh, um, it seemed to work. Yeah. But what I discovered is at this very formative time of medical training that um, not just I was, was I being taught to take care of the sick people, no matter what time of day or night across the Atlantic on a flight, whatever. Is there a doctor on board? Stick up your hand, that kind of thing. But it also seemed true that the sickest people were in other places. And I saw things that in this, you know, public system in, in Santiago that I had never seen in the inpatient halls of, um, of Calgary, where I was training at the time. So I knew that's the kind of doctor I wanted to be. And when I heard that there was already a group of doctors out there who had made a life and a movement out of the idea that every person deserves, no matter who they are, deserves dignity. It's about a lot about dignity for me. <laughs> it's making me emotional. Um, and because you see people die without a lot of dignity. And you never really go back to being the same person that you were after that. Um, so you're changed. And what happens, what happens in that instance is that you, um, you come back from a place like Sudan and well, you never really leave, but uh, you come back from a place like Sudan and then, and then um, you come from, leave the feeding center that held a, you know, 20 kids. And then you come back to your city that people's job is to cut out parts of people's stomachs because they can't, they can't lose weight otherwise. So what happens is um, the, Figure ground reversal, <laughs> you know, figure ground reversal happens a lot of the time. And it did for me. And you feel that people don't know what to talk to you about and don't, aren't sure you want to talk about what they want to talk about. <laughs> and so you think about how do I get back there? Because that's the, that's the world that makes sense to me now. This world is, is not, not grounded in reality. So... You know, it took me a few years to get my head back on straight after that. You know, it was really, uh, really traumatic. Um, you know, the book helped very much because I got a chance. You know, I wrote a blog while I was away and uh, it was MSF's first at the time. Just out of timing, really. And um, um, so the book meant I couldn't go back on the remission right away, which I normally probably would have done. So I had to kind of wrestle with these questions about why... If it's true that a human life has dignity no matter where it is, if that's true, and I felt it is true. I feel it is true. It is true. Why does it look so different in Sudan? Why don't people, why can't we get it? Is it the distance? Is it the distance? Maybe it's just the distance. We can only imagine pain in our family, and then we feel their pain in my mom or my, my brother, my family, my dad. And but when it gets a little bit more abstract than that, we lose some integrity of the ability to empathize without a more direct experience. So, you know, when it came to the book, I was like, well, I want to I want to capture the emotional like come up in that I got when I thought I'm just going to do this and it's going to be fine. I'm going to I'm ready. I thought I was ready. And that hubris <laughs> it seems to be a principle with which I intend to live my life. But um um, and then I wanted to, to erase the distance. So lose, you know, in a, in lose, humanize the, my patients in a way where I've, you know, that erase the distance. So that's what is a lot of moving, slowing down in the book and moving between the impersonality of like a time posted, almost blog like post to a very slow rendering of a quiet day in this rural hospital in Sudan. So that's, that's why MSF and that's why, that's why that book. When you got home, did people around you want to hear about your experiences in the, in the level of detail that you wanted to tell? 
Yeah, I think they did. It. You know, I, there's this uh, book by, uh, I think it's MSF put it out and it describes in this, um, in it, this uh, syndrome called new refrigerator syndrome. And it is a, uh, a person who comes back from an MSF like mission telling the story. Yeah, it was crazy. You know, we were evacuated. The national staff needed to stay. Um, we don't know. I haven't been in contact with them. We don't know if they're allies from my best friends and the parents, you know, fictional parents in the story say, wow, that's, that's intense. <laughs> we got a new refrigerator and you know, they're just really trying to share something, but there's just this like almost like a disconnect between between what you know in your heart and what is stunted in your ability to describe the intensity of the, the urgency that you feel, which is like, okay, stop what you're doing. Let's just go sort that up. Let's go, everybody, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. And, you know, at the same time, you also, you must live your life. You know, you can't just like endure only suffering and think that you're making a difference. You know, you're just joining the ranks, you know. Um, I asked, it's a weird question, if, if people want to hear it, but I asked because I, I'm told that Canadian soldiers and civilians who served in Afghanistan were sometimes told, prepare about a 90 second summary of what it was like, because folks back home won't want to hear more than that. And so you need to, you need to download some quick impressions and then the rest is between you and the people that you were with because People don't have a context for processing it, but it sounds like your experience is a little different. Yeah, you know, I guess the answer to that question is um, people did want to hear about it because I wrote a, <laughs> they wrote a, I read a book and they read it. Some of them read it, you know. Yeah. And so I think that's how you know I think people really do want to know what it's like. They, people really want to wake up. You know, they really want to understand how to engage with once they're able to solve your own problems how do you engage with the larger problems in your community and society you know in this one vivid and beautiful life we have and you know and the truth is like of all the people I've met I, I think I don't know I, I forgot the math is like somewhere like 40,000 patients or something like that you know I've met so few villains you know everyone is just all over the world everyone is just like so um surprised to be here at all and giving very little information about what to do, uh, how to live a life of meaning. So I, my, my sense is people do want to know. Sometimes they don't know how to help. And so we're left um, trying to, you know, in, deliver the emotionality of what the experience is like to go through as the closest rendering that a person might be able to integrate into their behaviors and their priorities so yeah i mean my my encouragement is well you know if you can't go away with msf or which i would recommend then you know you can give you can read you can learn you can listen to the stories of those people in their own voices um there are many there are um extraordinary moments in the more recent book uh in ethiopia where you ask young resident physicians what's the proper treatment course for this patient and they tell you something that is technically accurate, appropriate, and impossible to apply because none of the equipment and expertise is at hand. Uh, mm. it, it, that must be tremendously frustrating. Yeah, yeah. For more, for, for you know, for them and for me, <laughs> for them, it's because you want to to them to find in the aspiration a motivation that there has. Just like, you know, like I like Vaclav Havel's, uh, I stole this from James Rubinsky, by the way, his, his definition of his favorite definition of hope is, is not the belief that things are going to work out regardless of circumstance, but the belief that regardless of circumstance, something makes sense. And it makes sense to be there for a person who's been hit by a car and is afraid and alone and hurting even if it's only to treat their pain, even if it's only to let their family feel they have a place to go, even if you don't have 20 units of blood like we do it's in my hospital um, to give to an injured patient, it makes sense. So, you know, in the absence of the successes and, 
and and feeling that you're actually able to do do what you know you're capable of we we show solidarity with these young doctors through the longevity of this program and we every chance we get several months a year we stand beside them and we say we know you know we know we know and we're here and let's just keep on doing it because it makes sense and those of us who those doctors who've been coming with us these 10 years and those doctors who have now graduated you know in 2003 the first batch no 2003 2010 um they've seen the changes and they're incremental but they're real and there's a lot of work yet to do but that's our shared work in in not just in ethiopia i just mean globally that's our shared work is to put in the hands of people you know autonomy and a feeling that we will have claimed something true about our own humanity when every person knows that they're going to be cared for with love until they die, the day they die in their own home that's the goal you know that's the that's the only thing that makes sense to me and um you know i know it's i won't see it you know i know i won't see it but it 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 has wisdom <laughs> you know it has wisdom we can wish it in the part of you we can wish it and we can do it you know i believe it Back here in Toronto, in the early days of this crisis, uh, you started to go online nightly and uh, help people meditate. Uh, how did you integrate meditation into your own practice and your own life? And why did you decide that that was something that was worth sharing? Yeah, it's funny. You know, you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking about like my own, my Scholic's hierarchy of needs. <laughs> I put meditation in there twice. It's like number four and number one. And, and I just mean it in, I guess in a couple different ways. I mean, I think like, I'm just so curious about the nature of nature and the way to understand it is to be, pay attention to your experience. And what I discovered by paying attention, more attention to my experience is that I learned something about myself and also, um, my thought pattern started to change. And even in the meditation, you go from the self-referential beginning, like, um, should I be doing this? Am I doing it right? I'm kind of achy. Should I just actually cancel this and go for a walk outside? And after like, you know, 20, 30 minutes, you're like, that, that voice still circling, but what comes up is a different, a different thought processing system about whose nature sometimes is more, easy to describe in words like mm, insight or kindness and generosity and forgiveness and friendliness. And um, so I just noticed this change. You know, I'm not, I'm not out of the woods, right? I have a lot to work to do. But I also, you know, I came to it when I got back from Sudan and it was actually, I can remember the exact moment. It was a Massey College. There was an event for another author. I had swore, my book was, with my publisher and a former editor at the CMAJ and, and Marie Toddkill said, James, congratulations. I said, oh, thanks so much. I'm, I could, couldn't believe it. And she said, what, how are you going to stay connected to why you went to Sudan in the first place when you get all this, you know, attention that's going to briefly and brightly swing to you. And I thought, yeah, I don't want to lose that. So I started sitting up, sitting in practice. And then I just discovered by the time I did my MSF, next MSF mission, it was, uh, it really helped me recover and leave that very difficult, even a much more difficult mission than Sudan, really, in Dadaab, Kenya, to, um, to leave it with, with energy to continue this work in Ethiopia, play the long game, include my own self in the, same kind of friendliness I was trying to give to other people and you know, all the things. Um, and what did you bring from that to the current crisis? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, when, when this, because of the nature of this illness, it's invisible, right? You can't, <laughs> it's almost like the way it's perceived is like 
you're going to burst into flames, you know, and then it's like, it's, it's, it's this creeping inertial, curious thing that plays into our anxieties. You know, like I said, there is this, now the, on this next call, I'm going to go, um, I'm going to talk about, you know, what disability adjusted life years are. It's like, it's like life expectancy, but it's, it's life expect like healthy life years lost. The number one, the number one reason for healthy life years loss is pre COVID um, is in the developed world is anxiety and depression. That's number one. It's above heart disease. Huh. Yeah. And uh, in the middle and lower middle incomes, middle income countries, similarly true. Low income countries. No, it's like diarrhea, pneumonia, all this stuff. So, but by, by, 2030 apparently it will be globally it will be true even of 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 everywhere that anxiety and depression is the most uh, hurtful thing for us right now so when it came to you know figuring out how to show up for my community and that's what led to these kind of facebook live updates where i could just kind of tell people what it was actually like in the er because they were people were tripping out over like is it like this in italy I could use some of the tools I had from, you know, the medical editing years to say, you know, that <laughs> that's not a study. Okay. That what people are talking about is a study. That's not a real study. It's a hypothesis generating causation doesn't or association doesn't mean causation. And then, you know, I could meditate and with people and give them this, you know, sense to just to sit and breathe and realize that the future is undetermined, but the present is actually all right <laughs> for now. I'm breathing, I'm alive, my family's okay, I have food, and it gives you that kind of s safety, which is like, is that, isn't that, is that, when is that in Maslow's hierarchy? Is that, uh, is that number two? I think? Pretty high up, actually. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah, safety. I went, uh, I'm off Twitter, that's how I practice self-care, but I went and looked at your account nice. recently, and, uh, I saw that you had solicited opinions from colleagues and offered some suggestions for your, of your own about how uh, emergency rooms and hospitals might better prepare for future pandemics, might simply better adjust to the um, reality of downtown life in a big city like Toronto. Um, you had three suggestions. Can you go over them for us? Yeah, I'm going to make sure I recall them. Um, the first is housing yeah. the homeless. How come? Housing the homeless permanently. I, I just think it, you know, I, I can't help but put our organism of the city or the country or the world, like it's embedded in my understanding of the human body. So I always like, that's the metaphor that fits with me, immune system, my ERs are like white blood cells. Like that's just how I think about it. So if we really want to give ourselves uh, the freedom to know that we're safe which is shared freedom it's a shared freedom you know that's so that looks like giving people an address okay if you just want to be purely machiavellian about it just an address in case you want to contact trace somebody a lot of people who are living rough or people who don't have a home they don't you can't trace them and i don't it's, for me it's not about tracing it's about dignity is about is it actually possible to house people is it and it's it's not just housing okay that's just the first step it is about giving them the attention and opportunity that they need to take care of themselves which they can do it's about trusting them it's about recognizing that we have a stigma and a bias towards homelessness where we somehow see ourselves in them and we're afraid so we turn away so what I think would be so much more beautiful enunciation of our city and our, 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 our liveliness would be to house these people, give them the attention and care that they need, and then watch them transform, watch them start to actually take on responsibilities of caring for other people. And, you know, so that's, that's, that sounds like a beautiful dream, but I also think that it would save money. <laughs> you know, I just think like it hits on all of the levels. And when people say, you know, that type of thing is too expensive. I'm like, more expensive, too expensive compared to what? Compared to what? <laughs> compared to what? A carnival cruise? There's nothing more important. No, nothing more important than your health. Nothing. And um, 
So, you know, that would be, I think that's a specific thing that I think that we can talk about as a city about how to do that and what would that would look like, how much it would cost. We could study it and we could make it happen. We could. So I'm just, I choose concrete things. Um, the second thing was um, I really liked the, the ER is, is um, given an opportunity to be this kind of front line, have a bit of more space now. Like our numbers have dropped, but also people want to stand by us. So we have empty beds. Empty beds means we can see people. You've all, I've, I don't know I've how many people on the call have been to an ER. I did a lot of my medicine in the last 10 years in the hallway. And it's hard. And it's hard because people sometimes have private things to tell you. And they don't, so you, what you want to do is give people this like, your, your full attention and you want them to feel totally safe and totally trusted. And I think this, uh, you know, having uh, an attention to the ER is not a place to board patients. It's not a place for admitted patients to linger. Hopefully that sticks out. Um, and I don't know if this is my third one, but you know, I have probably have more than that. I like the idea of us moving as a society, to be honest, because I'm a bit biased towards not a five day work week and just, you know, kind of that smoothing that we were talking about, at least in the hospital, something that allows us this, uh, a more elaborate um, expression of the process at work inside the hospital. So that for me means more private space, more, more art, more places for people who are dying, more people who are trained to help people who are, you know, uh, frank discussions with people about, end of life wishes, um, how to make that uh, an ex beautiful expression of their life, you know, all these things that I think that we have capacity to do. Um, I hope we're able to pull this into a, our most beautiful expression of, of not just humanity, but emergency medicine. I, I spent a fair bit of time in the last couple of years in those hospitals on University Avenue in Toronto for family reasons. Yeah. And some of the best equipped hospitals in the world not great places to be. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, you know, you want to be hard headed and realistic and say, well, you know, they're not, they're not, it's not the four seasons. There's, you know, they're very, very utilitarian places, but there, it seems to me there's, there's, there's room for a better balance uh, mm -hmm. and that it, that would provide better healthcare. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, I, I set the objective to be, you know, we all get lost. You know, I, I, I'm not a hundred percent with all my patients. You know, I was the other yesterday I was working in the, I had some surprising news, <laughs> which happened yesterday. So I was um, kind of trying to refocus myself to a patient in front of me who came in with a certain type of pain and I had to refocus myself again and again, and again, I'd lose track. And I, I have to be honest and say, I'm sorry, you, you have to repeat yourself because I'm, my mind is just in another place right now. So I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm saying that we all get lost and it'd be so great to have reframing opportunities of how, what the, like I said, the very much more human places, no matter where we look, the sounds, the appearance, the art and the architecture and, you know, all of those things. I mean, that sounds ambitious and I, I'm certainly, you know, I know there are hard budget lines in our, um, in, in, in health budgets, but, like I said, I mean, it's more expensive than what? <laughs> more expensive than what? How do you, how, why would I, why do I only have a cheese sandwich to feed you? If part of the reason why you're here is because you don't have a good, you don't have enough money to feed yourself well. Why can I just give you a cheese sandwich? You know what I mean? There's one other thing that you mentioned in your back and forth with colleagues uh, about things, things to fix. And, and uh, I want to make sure I get it right because I think it's important. Uh, is addiction care. Uh, yeah. And I wonder what you meant right. by that. That's what it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that was the third one, 24-hour addiction care. So, yeah, that's been great because we see, you know, our mandate as a downtown hospital is to um, meet the needs of our patient population, many of whom have been taken by this fentanyl epidemic that's, you know, crept into our midst in the last 10 years or so. So, you know, recognizing that there is often um, not just harm reduction, 
which we're well aware of, and there's part of this part of it. But mitigating the worst of it and trusting, trusting that people will have, not everybody, but with kindness and attention can start to heal some of those emotional wounds that has led to them, you know, frankly, being suicidal a lot of the time. But, you know, they, they, they behave as if they are suicidal, although they would never say necessarily, I, I want to kill myself. You know, all evidence to the, to, is pointing that you actually are doing it. And if you spend enough time talking to that person, they'll admit to it generally. So trusting that we have these unmet needs in a lot of our people, which manifests as addictions, and it's okay. We don't stigmatize it. It's okay. No problem. And if you don't want to see any for our actions, uh, person here today, come back when you're ready. And we'll keep on having this conversation. That door is always open. And in that exchange, some healing can occur. So we're not, we're not mad at you. We're not afraid of you. We're not telling you to change your life. We're not saying that you better just pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and stop drinking and do us. Not what we're talking about. We're saying we're here for you. And that's just the type of, of healing that those people need, um, that we all need, isn't it? <laughs> Not just those people, yeah. all of us need. And um, so I think that increased recognition of, of, of how to be there for, for a stranger is, is a growth thing for all of us. Um, I'm glad to hear you out on this because, because uh, the opioid crisis as such has been uh, a subject of journalistic preoccupation for me for some time. Mm -hmm. And because in a few weeks, my guest here will be Anne Case and Angus Deaton, the American economists who coined the phrase deaths of despair and have written oh, yeah. a book wow. about uh, yeah. uh, th this wave of uh, overdose deaths, suicides, yep. and yep. alcoholism yep. deaths that yep. are actually shortening the life expectancy in the United States. Yep. And uh, this is a conversation that we, that we want to keep having. And it's also <laughs> a conversation I'll be having next week with my guest. Uh, Patty Heidi, the Minister of Health. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm glad that you were here to, to help kick it off. Uh, mm -hmm. As you mentioned, uh, I know you've got another call. You're doing this again uh, uh, yeah. um, for emergency room physicians at 8 p.m. Yeah. So yeah, I'm yeah. going to let you go, but I do want to thank you, Dr. James Muscalic, uh, um, author, physician, global globetrotter. Uh, <laughs> I, I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, it's my pleasure. For us. Yeah, glad to talk to you. And thanks, all, as always, to our uh, sponsors at the Canadian Bankers Association. We'll be back uh, next week. Uh, same bat channel, same bat time, uh, when my guest will be the Federal Minister of Health, Patty Haidu. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. We'll see you again soon.